Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Am I coming through good? It's always such a privilege to uh, be able to be here uh, and to have this pulpit to share the word of God with you all. For me, <clears throat> preaching is like the most fun someone can have. Uh, I honestly love it, and the preparation is really fun. Uh, everything about it, you just to open the word and see what God wants to tell us through it. Uh, Michael will send me messages several weeks in advance asking about dates. Hey, is this date good for you? And if it is, this is the passage. And I immediately get a Bible and open up to the passage it's like, it's exciting. You know, what are we, what am I going to be able to share? Uh, but preaching is not always easy. Some passages are difficult. Uh, some passages are harder to find the word in. And the famous uh, British pastor, Charles Spurgeon, tells a story about a young minister uh, going to a more experienced minister and expressing difficulty on um, preaching pat this certain passage and finding Jesus in that passage. And what the, the older minister responded with is, young man, from every town and every village and every little hamlet in England, wherever it may be, there is a road to London. And so from every text in scripture, there is a road to the metropolis of the scriptures, that is Christ. And my dear brother, your business is when you go to a text is to say, now what is the road to Christ? And then preach a sermon running along the road to the great metropolis, Christ. And I have never yet found a text that has not got a road to Christ in it. It's a really beautiful reminder that the whole Bible tells us about Jesus, even the difficult passages. And in the last few weeks and other times, Michael has had some really difficult passages in Isaiah to find those roads. You have to really dig and find them. I don't know if it's blind luck or if Michael's just very gracious and kind to me, but my passages have been extremely easy. In English, we call them softballs, like you lob it up. It's a baseball reference. I know it's not the greatest thing, but you lob it up, it's easy to hit. Chapter 28, what we're doing today, is no different. It is a, a gospel-saturated passage. It has literal direct references to Jesus Christ, and almost every step of the way, it is a gospel-saturated passage. So, lucky for me, I get all of the easy stuff, um, and I just hope it just works out that way, or the Lord knows that I need the easy ones. So, before we get to um, our direct references, because we do have some references to Jesus in here, uh, we'll kind of go through the first uh, few verses of chapter 28. We will start in verses 1 through 4, and it is judgment on Israel or Samaria. So judgment is being proclaimed on the northern kingdom um, of Israel. And the one thing I want to talk about here is the danger of self-sufficiency, believing um, that you are sufficient in yourself and that you don't need God. So let's look at what um, he has to say to Israel. It says, ah, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong like a storm of hail, a destroying tempest like a storm of mighty overflowing waters. He cast down to the earth with his hand. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley, will be like a first ripe fig before the summer when someone else sees it, he swallows it as soon as it is in his hand. So uh, in these scriptures, Israel is often referred to as either Israel, Samaria, or Ephraim. And in this passage, it's Ephraim. And the thing about it is when it talks, keeps talking about the head of the rich valley, the northern kingdom and Samaria in particular was literally a very, very rich, fertile valley. Uh, they didn't really have any struggles with producing enough uh, produce and things to, to have a very comfortable life. And this was kind of the thing for them was they kind of changed into a mindset that they didn't need God to get by. Things were just really great for them. They were rich. Uh, they had lots of really good land and they didn't need him. 
And that's the problem with Israel is thinking that they had enough prosperity in themselves. They didn't need proper worship anymore. They didn't need the, the priesthood to act correctly, uh, the sacrificial system. They didn't need these things anymore because they were good enough on their own. And God, when he says, ah, at the beginning, this word in the Hebrew is like sounding alarm. It's saying that what's coming is not good. So he tells us in verses two through four that Samaria is going to be destroyed. And these metaphors of a storm and a flood coming through is about the Assyrian Empire that will come and conquer them. Verse four is particularly uh, robust, strong language about how fast it's going to happen when it says that it's like the first ripe fig that someone just plucks and swallows. That's how quick it will happen. Uh, you can imagine uh, figs are not in season. You're really craving some figs. They're about to be ready, and you see one ripe one. You've been craving them the whole time that they haven't been in season. You just grab it and eat it that quick. That's how fast Samaria will fall. Verses 5 and 6, we're going to see this several times in this passage, where, uh, and this is really God's nature. He always pronounces judgment and then gives hope of redemption. Verses 5 and 6 are that way. It says, in that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people and a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. So in God's word, in judgment, there's always hope. The faithful can rest in the Lord. Of all the things that are going wrong in the northern kingdom, there are people that are still faithful to the Lord, and God wants you to know that there is hope for those people. Before we move on, I want to say just to chase a rabbit for a second and say, in your own personal discipleship and in your own life, I really recommend getting some sort of commentary or Bible study or just a, a study Bible with notes in the bottom. Because a passage like this, after verse 6, we're actually going to transition from judgment against Israel to judgment against Judah in the southern kingdom. And then a few verses later, we're going to change the point of view of our speaker from uh, Isaiah and the word of the God to the religious leaders in Judah. And it can seem extremely confusing at first if you don't have a resource to explain to you that these things are happening, because it doesn't tell us. In verse 7, when it says, these also reel with wine, these are religious re leaders in Judah. We've completely changed kingdoms. And then we'll, like I said, in a, in a few verses in 9 and 10, we'll change the perspective of the speaker. And uh, there's no way to really know those things unless you have some sort of resource to guide you. So just real quick uh, reminder, recommendation to have something to help you work through more difficult, uh, especially Old Testament passages like this. So verses uh, 7 through 13 are judgment on Judah, and we'll look at verses 7 and 8 first, and we will talk about the danger of self-indulgence. So in the northern kingdom, the issue was uh, we're good enough on our own. Uh, we don't need the Lord anymore. We are taking care of ourselves. In the southern kingdom, uh, we have the religious leaders in particular and the people in general uh, just doing whatever they want to do, not obeying uh, the law of God. And what we see in verses 7 and 8 is the sad state of those tasked with leading God's people. So let's look at verses 7 and 8 real quick. It says, These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. One great thing about the word of God, it's always really polite, really clean, nothing uh, offensive or difficult to read. And you see this like verse eight, the tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. Isaiah is using some really graphic language to describe to us how far morally the priests and the prophets have fallen. This is their lifestyle. Um, you can imagine they're just always in this drunken state, and it tells you that they're not, uh, they're not giving the word appropriately anymore. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 11, it tells us about the priests. You are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. This was the job of the priests. They were supposed to be teaching God's word, not filling tables with vomit. In Malachi chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, uh, many years later here, which is kind of sad, we see not much has changed, but it starts by explaining what the priest's job was. It says, my covenant with him, talking about the priest, my covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. 
He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So this is what we see going on in this passage is the religious leaders in the, in the southern kingdom of Judah have completely fallen uh, from the Lord and are doing all these bad things and nothing that they're supposed to do. So verses 9 and 10, this is what we were talking about a minute ago, the speaker changes. In verses 9 and 10, um, there, these religious leaders are speaking back to Isaiah. So when it says, to whom will he teach knowledge, they're talking about Isaiah. So it says, to whom will he teach knowledge and to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast. For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So what we see here is the religious leaders kind of mocking Isaiah. And what we want to look at in these passages is the danger of pride. These religious leaders are so proud of themselves, and uh, they think they know so much. Uh, they have so much wisdom, so much religious, if you will, spiritual wisdom, that the law doesn't mean anything to them anymore. They, they equate it to child's play. They say, well, who is Isaiah going to talk to? Is it going to be the kids weaned from the mill like babies, those taken from the breast? That's how young they're referring to. They say, this doesn't mean anything to us anymore. It's just a precept upon precept, almost like it's a burden. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. It's like you say the same thing over and over again. We know these things, and we don't need to hear them anymore. In Proverbs 16, 18, it tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And this is what the religious leaders in Judah will experience, is that their pride will lead to their fall. So in verses 11 through 13, we see that this judgment will come, and uh, it's coming from uh, foreign invaders. And once again, we're going to be talking about the Assyrian Empire here. And it says that for by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people. This is not good news because he's not going to really speak to his people through these foreign invaders, but it will be judgment coming. It says, to whom he has said, this is rest give rest to the weary, and this is reposed, yet they would not hear. And the word of the Lord will be to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So what we see here is that judgment is coming on them uh, in the way of foreign invaders. The way that God works judgment we have a slide here that's how God executes judgment. And this is so common in the prophetic literature, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all these. What God does is he warns his people through his prophets. He says, this is what you're doing wrong and you need to repent from it. So he calls for repentance. This is everything you're doing wrong. This is why you're not living correctly. Repent from those things. So the people have a choice to repent and turn from their way and be restored to God. But if they do not, then judgment is coming. And sadly, in the Old Testament, we rarely ever see anyone repent and turn. It's, it's, what's even more sad is one of the only instances we see is a pagan nation in Nineveh in the book of Jonah. When uh, Jonah goes and says, hey, if you don't change your ways, we're going to destroy this city. And they all go, okay, we'll change our ways. Uh, and they're not the people of God. Unfortunately, God's chosen people rarely respond to the prophet correctly, and what we see is judgment come. So these verses are that exact thing. And the problem with verses 11 through 13 is that at this point, it's too late. It's too late. You've been warned over and over and over and over again to change your ways and to repent and to be restored to a correct relationship with God, and it's been rejected over and over again. When they look out their window and see the foreign invaders coming, at that point, it's too late. You've had a chance to correct your ways, and you didn't. And this is no different than us today. The gospel message is beautiful, but it's also a warning. It is a warning that if you don't accept this message, if you don't accept Christ as your Savior, and you don't accept Him, 
that you will face judgment. And something I heard Francis Chan say a million times is you never know when God will take your life from you. And at that moment, if you haven't responded to the call for repentance, it's too late. If Jesus Christ comes again to restore this world and, and make it new, the moment you look up and see him, if you haven't repented, it's too late. And that's the problem in these verses 11 through 13. They're all making fun of Isaiah, saying it's child's play and that they don't need this stuff. And they're going to look up one day and that judgment that's been uh, pronounced against them is going to be on their doorstep and it's too late. I challenge you as I do over and over again, that if you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you need to do it as soon as possible because you never know when it might be too late. So we move into the next verses. This is where we get to talk about Jesus and the, the uh, predictive prophecy. This is really good verses. But first, um, we have to look at verses 14 and 15. Uh, we've talked about this historical um, context before, but when it talks in these verses about making a covenant with death uh, and an agreement with Sheol, it's talking about Judah's agreement or alliance with Egypt to fight off Assyria. So instead of trusting the Lord to take care of them and their needs, uh, they go running off to Egypt and make this uh, agreement with them instead. So verses 14 uh, through 15 say, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with shale, we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. This is a really sad state, again, of Judah. They say all these things that you've uh, predicted against us, this overwhelming whip, it's not going to hurt us when it comes through because we made this agreement with Egypt. We have sought salvation in another place. This is a really dangerous thing for these people to do, to seek salvation apart from God. In 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, it tells us um, a little bit about this story. Uh, there's a guy who's a spokesman for the Assyrian king, and they call him the Rabshaka. I'm not really sure if I pronounce that right, but it's a really cool name for a spokesman. Uh, think like in the movie 300, the guy that gets kicked down into the hole you know, when Gerard Butler says, this is Sparta and kicks the guy in the chest, that guy was a spokesman for the king. So this guy comes up, spokesman for the king, and he says, behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it, such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. And it's like, they're even being made fun of by their enemies. So they go to Egypt for salvation as opposed to, to, to God. They go to Egypt for their salvation, and even their enemies are making fun of them. Are you kidding me? You're trusting Egypt? Everybody that tries to, uh, everybody that depends on him is like a broken uh, reed that sticks you in the hands. And we can do this in our own lives so often where we trust in other things to save us. We may trust in financial security. We may trust in our career. We may trust in our family. Uh, whatever it is we think we need to offer us salvation in a sense in our life. It's really sad to me that some of the richest people in the world, Larry Ellison uh, is really famous for this. Jeff Bezos has done this. They've invested hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in life extension research is what they call it. And what it is, is we want to live forever. Larry Ellison is a billionaire and has been on record over and over again saying that he is just scared to die. And he has got all these, think about the good you could do in the world with this money. And he keeps dumping it into what is frankly quite crazy research about, you know, freezing yourself and then hoping you know, they can thaw you out later on in life. And you can just, I guess, pick up where you left off. He might be disappointed if it's several hundred years and inflation means he's not rich anymore. But it's really, really sad, the things that people will trust in for salvation. And God asked his people over and over again to just trust in him and they would be fine and they didn't do it and instead they go to Egypt and it didn't work out right. One of the worst parts is when it says we have made lies our refuge and in falsehood we have taken shelter. In Psalm chapter 18 verse 2 it's such a better explanation of what we are to do. It says the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 
this is the way that we as Christians are to seek our salvation. God is supposed to be where we run to in our times of need. The very first thing you do is run to him in prayer and just, it, the Bible tells us to cast our burdens on him. Don't think of what you can do first. Think of what he can do because he is the one that we must seek our refuge in. So we finally get to verse 16. The whole chapter, this is like the highlight, it's the best part. It is God's plan for salvation and God's plan for redemption. And it says, therefore, this says the Lord of God, behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. So this cornerstone is what we are to believe in. It says in the last line there, whoever believes will not be in haste. When it says haste in this passage, it's, it's talking about the fact that Israel or Judah ran so quickly to Egypt. Like they so hastily, when they found out they were in trouble, ran to something else. And if you believe and trust in God and have that confidence, then you don't have to do that. But what is this cornerstone talking about? The question is not, what is the cornerstone talking about, but who? The New Testament tells us that this cornerstone in this passage is about the coming of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. In Romans chapter 9, verse 33, it says, As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So this stone, this cornerstone is him. It is Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, we read this this morning in our scripture reading. It says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are to be, are being built up as a spiritual house to be holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, and this is our passage, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So there we see the change in the New Testament. Instead of whoever believes will not be in haste, we have whoever believes in him, in Jesus Christ, will not be put to shame. Verse 7, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's from Psalm 118, 22, and then verse 8, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and that's from Isaiah 8, 14. So the New Testament explains to us this precious cornerstone that our salvation is built on is Jesus Christ. And it takes, it's good to take just a second and talk about what we even mean. Um, if you've never read this simple explanation, and especially in ancient architecture, the cornerstone was the very first stone laid before building a structure. It was the biggest, the strongest, the flattest, the most uh, we call square because it was the, the best stone, the rest of the structure, the integrity and the alignment and the strength of the rest of the structure was all based on this cornerstone. If you go to a structure, an ancient structure, and remove the cornerstone, the structure will fail. And that is why Jesus has to be our cornerstone. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But first, let's um, run through the rest of this passage real quick. So in verses 17 through 21, we see judgment for those who do not trust. So God gives them this message of redemption in the cornerstone, and then he explains what will happen to those who do not. It says, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. So what's God saying is he will judge people based on righteousness and judge, ju uh, justice. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and waters will overwhelm the shelter. Then your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it passes through, it will take you for morning by morning. It will pass through by day and by night. And it will be sheer terror to those who understand the message. For the bed is too short to stretch oneself on and the covering too narrow to wrap oneself in. For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perizim as in the valley of Gibeon, he will be roused to do his deed. Strange is his deed, and to do his work, alien is his work. There are several good things in this little passage, uh, 17 through 21, that we want to look at. 
Um, first of all, when it's talking about wiping away the covenant and the agreements, he's obviously talking about that your alliance with Egypt is not going to save you. You will experience the judgment that I've pronounced on you, regardless of what you think you've done to stop it. One of the worst parts about this passage, though, is verse 19. And this is such, it should break your heart as a believer, and it should awaken your heart if you have not accepted Christ yet. And when it says it will be sheer terror to understand the message, it seems like such a small thing. But what it's saying is you've heard this message over and over again. Isaiah has told you over and over if you don't repent that judgment's coming. And you act like you either don't care or don't understand the message. And the day that the Assyrians come, the day that the enemies come and take you, then you will understand the message. It will be very clear what you've been hearing all the way up until this point. You may have made fun of the speaker saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. This is childish. God's not going to destroy us. And the day that judgment comes, now you will understand. This has very, very important uh, modern application as well. Everyone that rejects the gospel and mocks it as, as a, a message of a fairy tale or something like that, when judgment comes to them, they will understand understand the message. They may have re refused the gospel over and over again and even mocked those who brought it to them, but one day they will understand it. The Bible tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Life is very, very, very fragile, and you never know when you could be alive one minute, and then the next minute you will be facing the judgment seat of Christ, and it, it's that moment that people will understand the message, and if it is someone who has not trusted Christ with their soul, it will be a terror. It says it will be sheer terror to understand the message, and we want to avoid that as much as possible. If you are a believer, it is your job to offer that warning to other people and tell them that they need to follow Christ. Another thing we'll look at is verse 21. It says that the Lord will rise up on Mount Perizim in the valley of uh, Gibeon. These are two victories that God won for King David against the Philistines. And it says to do his deed, strange is his deed, and to his work, alien is his work. The reason God's work here is strange and alien is because he is fighting against his own people. God is saying himself that this action that I'm taking, that I'm fighting against my own people, that I'm disciplining my own people, is alien and strange for me. God does not want to do this, but his hand has been forced. In verse 22, it says, Now therefore, do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong, for I have heard a decree of destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land. Verse 22 is once again, we see there is an offer of redemption. You've heard all this judgment, and in verse 22 it says, Therefore, do not scoff. It's saying you still have a chance to turn. The last little section is verse 23 through 29. And it has a lot of language about uh, agriculture. And it's a pretty simple concept. It's explaining that farmers know what they're supposed to do to reap a harvest. They know with certain crops how to plant, when to plant, when to harvest them, and all those things. And the whole point is that they have the knowledge to know that what they do, their actions, will result in a harvest. And there, he uses this example to explain that what God does, this strange alien work, this judgment, this discipline, will result in a harvest that God knows. So it says, give ear and hear my voice, give attention and hear my speech. Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow his ground? When he has leveled its surface, does he not scatter deal, sow cumin, and put, it, put in wheat in rows and barley in its proper place and amor as the border? For he is rightly instructed, his God teaches him. Deal is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over cumin, but deal is beaten out with a stick and cumin with a rod. Does one crush grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When he drives his cartwheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. So the whole point of those verses is just that God knows what he's doing. It does seem alien. It does seem strange that God is judging his people in this way. But in the end, the harvest that God reaps, he knows what it is going to be. It's extremely important. And verse 29 is a beautiful reminder of why we can trust him. 
it may seem like in your life you're not sure how God's actions are leading to the better, like therefore your betterment. But it tells us that this comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. We can trust God with our lives, and it's why we have to listen when he speaks. Before we close, I want to talk just a little bit more about the cornerstone, the verses talking about Christ being that cornerstone that our salvation, our lives are built upon. Both in your personal life and the life of the church, Jesus has to be the cornerstone of everything. Harvest KL has to be built on Jesus Christ and nothing else. The alternative to being a cornerstone in an ancient building is just being another block. Another block. Uh, you could use a Pink Floyd reference and say another brick in the wall, if anybody's a Pink Floyd fan. But if you go to an old structure and you were to hammer out one brick, it would fall out and you would just have a hole in your wall. Wouldn't be a big deal. Uh, you could go find another random brick. You could tap it out, fall out. You have two holes in your wall. No big deal. If you were to go and take the cornerstone out, the structure would collapse and could not stand. The church has to be built on Jesus, and it has to be this way. If we were to take the gospel out of harvest, would the church still stand? The answer has to be no to that. And your personal life is exactly the same way. You have to have Jesus as the cornerstone, and if you remove him, everything in your life should collapse around it. If you can take Jesus out of your life like one of those bricks, and almost nothing changes except for a Jesus-sized hole in your life, that is not acceptable. We have to put everything on him. Everything in our lives has to be built around the gospel and our trust in Jesus. We have to make him the cornerstone of our lives and of our church, and we have to give the message to the world that that's the way it is. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity that you give us uh, every week, Lord, to come and to lift up our praises to you and to dig into your word, Lord, and to see what you have for us in it, Lord. God, we do ask that you just uh, be with Harvest and let us have everything we do, every action we take, every word we say be based on the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ and that it is truly our cornerstone, Lord, that everything is built around it. God, we also ask that you do that for our personal lives and let us realize that we should take everything in our lives and build it on the sure foundation of Jesus, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.